The Packard Clipper is an automobile that was built by the Packard Motor Car Company, and by the later Studebaker Packard Corporation, for model years 1941 to 1942, 1946 to 1947 and 1953 to 1957. For 1956 only, Clipper was classified as a standalone mark. The Clipper was introduced in April 1941, as a mid-model year entry. It was available only as a four-door sedan. The Clipper name was reintroduced in 1953, for the automaker's lowest-priced lineup. By 1955, the Clipper models were seen as diluting Packard's marketing as a luxury automobile mark. It was named for a type of sailing ship, called a Clipper. For only the 1956 model year, the Clipper became a standalone make of automobile produced by the Studebaker Packard Corporation. The Clipper line was aimed at the middle price field of American automobiles that included DeSoto, Oldsmobile, Hudson, and Mercury. Following the closure of Packard's Detroit, Michigan factory in 1956, the Clipper mark was discontinued, although the Clipper name was applied to 1957 Packards that were built at Studebaker's South Bend, Indiana, factory. By the end of the 1930s, Packard president Max M. Gilman realized that his best efforts to improve profitability during the last lean decade had not been enough. The Packard 120 had arrived in 1935 and saved the company from immediate demise. The 110 had followed, achieving even higher volume. Despite a strong performance in the revival year 1937, Packard sales had plummeted as the Depression returned in 1938, and the 76,000 sales for the calendar year 1939 were hardly past the break-even point. They netted the company a scant half million dollars. This precarious financial state combined with the new model developments among Packard's rivals, GM's LaSalle and Cadillac Series 61, Chrysler Imperial, and the Lincoln Zephyr, meant that Mr. Gilman needed something radically new and that he needed it in a hurry if he wanted to save the company. Introduced just eight months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Packard's hopes for the future rode on the new car design. The Packard Clipper represented a break from traditional styling and embodied an abrupt change in construction techniques. However, World War II intervened. It made the investment to produce one of the only all-new 1941 American cars impossible to realize in a normal marketplace. The Clipper's market timing could not have been worse. After only 16,600 of the 1941 models were made, and a few thousand 1942s, Detroit stopped building civilian automobiles to concentrate on defense production. By the time cars began rolling off the lines again in late 1945, the still sleek Clipper's impact had been diminished by four years of war. The bright promise of its debut was limited by late introduction, what should have been its solid sophomore year was weakened by World War II. Its third and fourth years were postponed until 1946 to 1947. Though Packard designer John Reinhardt and other company insiders wanted to retain and Sweden, in Reinhardt's words, the Clippers felt lines, Packard management felt pressured by new post-war designs throughout the industry, introducing the mixed review, bathtub, or pregnant elephant, 1948 to 1950 Packards. There were only two other automakers that introduced all new 1941 models which were stopped short by the American entry into World War II and thus rendered obsolete before their time. Besides Packard, Ford brought out a much-changed design for the 1941 model year, the restyled Ford and its Mercury clone. Nash also produced all new 1941 models, using monocoque, unitized, construction for the first time. General Motors redesigned for 1942, arguably a piece of bad timing even worse than Packard's, but the 1942 cars were so relatively few in number that they still look reasonably new when GM resumed automotive production in 1946. The Ford-Mercury comparison is not apt either, primarily because these were quite different cars from Packard's, with no pretense of luxury. Nor did their design history mirror the Clippers. The 1941 Fords and Mercury's were evolutionary developments, clearly related to the 1940s they replaced. The Clipper was such a dramatic break with the previous Packard design as to preclude comparisons. After the war, while Packard opted to improve the Clipper, while other automakers restyled its models for 1949, while the bulbous 1941 to 1948 Fords, Mercury's, and Nash's were replaced by modern designs, the Clipper was replaced by a bulbous 1948 upgrade that, while well received in its initial year, aged quickly in comparison with the new models from the Big Three and Nash. A 1949 Mercury 8 which had cost $2,000 new was still worth $430 five years later, 
while a 1949 Packard 8 which had cost $2,200 new was worth only $375. Motor Trend Automotive journalist Tom McCahill, who had raved about the Packard Clipper, called the 1948 Packard, a goat. The Clipper's timing was unfortunate. The state of the world being beyond Packard's control, Clipper production came to a halt on February 9, 1942, just as it was hitting its stride and when Clipper styling had spread through the entire Packard model lineup. A full envelope body with a modern look was a long time coming at Packard. Cadillac was wearing pontoon fenders and flowing lines by 1934, and had adopted all steel bodies by 1935. In 1936, Lincoln announced the Zephyr, with an all-steel unit body, and a shape so advanced that derivations of it were still in production 12 years later. Chrysler also tried introducing a streamlined platform which the market didn't respond well to, named the Chrysler Airflow. By comparison, Packard adhered to traditional, crisp, conservative styling. Its main acknowledgement of new era styling was the skirted fender which appeared in 1933. Packard, like Lincoln and Cadillac, had survived the depression by building medium-priced cars, the 120, Zephyr, and LaSalle, respectively. But unlike its rivals, Packard styling had remained arch-traditional. Unlike Lincoln, Packard followed the medium-priced 120 with an almost low-priced car, the 6, later briefly known as the 110. Unlike Cadillac, Packard refused to market its cheaper models by a different name and remained wedded to them long after prosperity had returned. By 1941, the year the Clipper debuted, the least expensive Cadillac was priced at $1,445. The lowest priced Packard sold for only $927. Arguably its conservative design philosophy had stood Packard well in the years leading up to the Clipper. The company was able to advertise, and sold quite a few Packards with, styling continuity from year to year. There was a family resemblance between a 1939 and a 1932. In 1939, the comparison of its 120 with the LaSalle, the company declared that, Packard has style identity. Packard styling is consistent. But look at the 1938 LaSalle. About the only similarity is in the name, and who can be sure that a sudden fanciful style change won't make the 1939 a style orphan? Mercedes-Benz and Rolls-Royce survived for years with very expensive, but dated designs. Packard also survived with limited styling change for at least 8 or 9 years up through 1940. Packard's hallmarks were good ones, the chiseled frontispiece, the grille recalling classic Greek architecture, the ox-yoke radiator, hood shape harkened back to the Model L of 1904, the cormorant mascot, red hexagon hubs, and arrowhead side spear, were recognizable and timeless. To create a modern envelope body while retaining those famous hallmarks was no small undertaking. It is still one of the chief accomplishments of automotive industrial design that the people who created the Packard Clipper were able to do so flawlessly. Advertising invited America to, Skipper the Clipper, in 1941. It was showing the country an obviously brand new, up-to-date, in Packard's words, windstream, or, speedstream, automobile, yet one which was still undeniably a Packard. Though it did not owe a curve or contour to any previous model, the milestone 1941 Clipper carried the same inimitable radiator and hood shape, as well as the same arrowheads and red hexes, and the same long hood and close-coupled profile of Packards of the past. Introduced in April 1941, as a single four-door sedan model, the introductory Clipper was by no means a cheap or even medium-priced car. Per Packard chronicler M.G.H. Scott, the Clipper was neither junior nor senior, and priced as it was since the days of strictly high-hat lux were over thanks to more affordable engineering improvements from the late 30s and more egalitarian times. The Clipper sold for around $1,400, in a market niche between the 120 and 160, competing in the midst of Buick Roadmaster, Cadillac 61, Chrysler New Yorker, Lincoln Zephyr. Despite a mid-year start, the Clipper garnered 16,600 sales for the 1941 model year, eclipsing the total year's 17,100 less expensive 120s. Clearly, for Packard, it was the wave of the future. By the 1942 model year, Clipper styling spread through the Packard line, except where special tooling existed, convertibles, taxis, wagons, and commercial cars. Curiously, however, the market slot occupied by the 1941 Clipper was abandoned, recreating a gap between the base 282 cubic inch Clipper Custom, $1.341, and the 356 cubic inch 160 Clipper, 
$1,688. The bulk of the 1942 production was concentrated on the 120-inch, 3,000mm, wheelbase junior models, but the 160 and 180 Clippers proved conclusively that Packard was as much a builder of luxury cars as ever. The 1942-160-180 Clipper was 9.5 inches, 240 millimeters, longer and 140 pounds, 64 kilograms, heavier than its square-rigged 1941 predecessor, with wider cabin, nearly as much rear legroom as the long wheelbase 1941 to 1942 160 and 180, which retained the old-style Packard body. The smooth 356 cubic inch, 5,830 cubic centimeters, straight eight of the 160 and 180 Clippers, featuring a 104 pound, 47 kilograms, nine main bearing crankshaft and hydraulic valve lifters, was the most powerful engine in the industry through 1948, exceeding Cadillac's V8 by 15 horsepower, 11 kilowatt. It could deliver 70 miles per hour, 110 kilometers per hour, in second gear overdrive and take the 4,000 pound, 1,800 kilograms, car to over 100 miles per hour on Packard's Proving Grounds Bank Oval Track. In 1950, 10 years after Packard's nonpareil 9 main bearing 356 inline 8 debuted, Rolls-Royce mirrored the design for their 9 main bearing, F-head 346 cubic inch V80 inline 8, used only in a handful of Phantom IVs produced solely for heads of state, military vehicles, and Dennis fire trucks. Like Packard's 245 cubic inch 6 used in Junior Clippers, Packard's 1940-1950-356 Super-8 engine also appeared in Marine Guys 1947-1951. The top-of-the-line Clipper 180 offered two shades of leather or six colors of wool broadcloth upholstery, Mostred carpeting from New York's Schulten looms, walnut-grained instrument panels, Amboina burl garnish moldings, seatback stuffed with down and rear center armrests. Unlike any other contemporary, the post-war custom Super's headliner was seen fore to aft instead of sideways. Packard claimed that the unique headliner was adopted to provide a more spacious feel to the interior. With a nearly full line of clippers, Packard managed to build 34,000 1942 models before production ceased in February, an annual rate of around 80,000. According to John Reinhardt, there is no doubt that clipper styling would have proliferated in 1943 to 1945. The next logical step would have been convertibles and commercials, and a wagon. But the war intervened, whereas Cadillac with its greater facilities was able to field a complete line of restyled 1942s, including convertibles, all of which came right back in 1946, Packard was able only to add a club coupe body before the war. The lower-priced two-door club coupe was the sportier clipper despite a weight saving of only 45 pounds. With about 40 built before production ended in February 1942, a single 160 the only example known to exist. Post-war, about 600 senior coupes were made, compared to about 6,600 senior sedans. In 1946 to 1947 the numerical designations were dropped and the line consisted of Clipper 6s and 8s on the 120-inch, 3,000mm, wheelbase and supers and custom supers on the 127-inch, 3,200mm, wheelbase. For the first time there were now seven passenger sedans and limousines, riding a 148-inch, 3,800mm, wheelbase. For their type, these professional Packards enjoyed success. They compare with Cadillac's 1946-1947-75, beating it not only by 15 horsepower, 11 kilowatt, but by a foot of wheelbase, yet selling for about the same $4,500 to $5,000. Counting several thousand bare chassis supplied to commercial body manufacturers, the 75 outsold the long wheelbase clipper. But for finished cars from the factory, production was about 3,100 cars each for 1946 to 1947 combined. Many economic experts predicted that the end of World War II would bring a severe recession or perhaps even another depression to the United States. They had history on their side because the U.S. did experience a sharp, albeit brief economic downturn after World War I. Perhaps Packard's management team took these calamitous warnings to heart while planning its post-war strategy. If the economy were to fall, it would make sense to market the low-priced Packards, the Clipper 6s and 8s, rather than the upmarket Supers and Custom Supers. The post-war economy proved the experts wrong. It was healthy and many materials, notably sheet steel, were in short supply.
workers who would never have struck during the war, now demanded more money, and so the automakers and their suppliers endured a series of costly strikes. These factors, of course, strangled production. At the same time, Americans were willing to spend freely to acquire most anything, especially new cars. Packard could not produce cars in the numbers intended, and it was selling the less profitable junior series models. Packard management's chief interest after the war was in the same medium-priced cars that had saved it during the Depression, the 6 and Junior 8s. The company was still firmly run by President George Christopher, who had helped save it with the 120. Christopher, a graduate of GM's Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac divisions, Christopher had Junior Clippers in production by October 1945, but it was not until June 1946 that the first Super, Custom Super came down the line. Total Packard production in the first two post-war model years was 82,000, against 91,000 Cadillacs. The difference was that the vast bulk of Packard production was of Clipper 6s and 8s priced $1,700 to $2,200. Other than the less popular Series 61 price leader, which replaced the LaSalle for 1941, post-war Cadillacs began at around $2,300. Packard could have built and sold as many senior clippers as Cadillac did Series 62s and 60 specials, had Christopher and his team so chosen. The long wheelbase, 147-inch, clipper 7-passenger sedan and limousine were competitive with Cadillac and the low-volume Chrysler Crown Imperial. Lincoln had no long models, in the first two post-war years. Likewise, among owner-driver models, Packard had Cadillac neatly bracketed. The Cadillac 62 sedan and coupe started around $2,300 in 1946, about the same price as the Super Clipper. Against Cadillac's $3,100 60 Special, which came only as a four-door sedan, Packard offered the more sumptuously trimmed custom Super Clipper sedan or coupe for about the same money. The 1946-1947 Cadillac Series 62 and 60 Special outsold the concurrent Packard Super and custom Super Clipper 3 to 1 simply because George Christopher's board chose to focus on building junior models, which accounted for 80% of Packard's post-war production. This is a new point that has been missed in the many post-mortems of Packard's fall. Reverting to strictly luxury cars would not have meant downsizing the labor force or contracting the facilities. The market for anything on wheels was bottomless, it did not matter whether the car cost $1,800, Clipper 8, $2,300, Clipper Super, or $2,900, Custom Super. It would have sold, nor is this a hindsight judgment, since Packard management was capable of seeing this at the time. At the start of post-war car production, Fortune recorded a consensus that, there now exists a market for from 12 to 14 million cars, and that was in a day when 3 million or so cars was considered a very good year. In 1941, Fortune continued, the 32 million American families owned 29,600,000 cars. As 1946 began, the cars were down to 22 million which is not very far from the danger point, 18 million, of a transportation breakdown. Of this remaining total, at least half are in their last days. It did not take a mystic to comprehend these facts, as the late Hickman Price Jr., who bought Willow Run for the Kaiser Fraser Partners, once said, I believe we would have a period of three or four years. I remember putting 1950 as the terminal date in which we can sell everything we can make. Almost immediately after production got rolling in 1945, chief stylist John Reinhardt was told, much against his judgment, to update the clipper. If Dutch Darren had thought Packard loaded, gobs of clay, onto his original model in 1941, what must he have thought of the hideously bulbous 1948 models? Furthermore, there was no change in market orientation, still rooted firmly in the medium price field. Indeed, in 1948, the final year for President George Christopher, Senior Packard production dwindled from 20% to 11% of total production, trailing Cadillac by tens of thousands. Packard, as a later president, James Nance, stated, handed the luxury car market to Cadillac on a silver platter. Professional designers have contemplated continuations of the Clipper into 1948 to 1949, with a broader range of body styles including hardtops and convertibles. Their designs were beautiful and would have kept pace with the all-new Cadillacs and Lincolns of 1949, allowing Packard to come back with its first post-war redesign in 1950. But the key failure was to reorder the corporation's priorities and establish it once again as the American luxury car it had been so successful for 40 years. Packard lost its battle for survival since the company could not achieve GM volume.
it would have been smarter to extract more profit from each car built. Not only were customers standing in line, but by putting top-of-the-line Packards on the road, the public's image of Packard as a luxury car builder would have been enhanced. The 1948 facelift lost the design continuum the Clipper had offered. Though it retained the Clipper's basic shell, the 1948 model bore no resemblance to its predecessor. The bulbous 1948 design became known to some as the upside-down bathtub, or pregnant elephant, and Packard's market share declined. The money spent on the facelift, as John Reinhardt and others maintained, should have gone into an expansion of Clipper body styles to compete with Cadillac. Packard recognized this too late when it brought out a convertible as the first 1948 body style, a model it should have had by 1947 at the latest. Eighteen months later Cadillac was already out with the Coupe de Ville hardtop, while Packard's newest model was the station sedan. By 1948, it was clear that the future of the car business belonged to the giants. At least one independent manufacturer was ready to make that happen, George W. Mason, president of Nash Kelvinator. Mason wanted a post-war combination of independence, a fourth player in an automotive big four, with Packard as the luxury division. All independent automakers faced problems. By 1954, there was only a big two, as Chrysler's market share fell to 12.9%. All Cadillacs had been downsized for 1936, and were effectively junior cars ever since, increasingly sharing components with GM's other divisions. Despite the company's post-war cash reserves, Packard continued production of its now-dated L-head straight-eight engines through 1954, competing against a field of OHV V8S. Moreover, the small independent automakers could not achieve unit costs and tool amortization down to GM, Ford levels, nor afford the requisite TV advertising and annual model changes. The Clipper nameplate was dropped for 1948 as Packard issued its 22nd series automobiles, which, while proclaimed by the company as, all new, were actually restyled Clippers. Only the 1941-1947 Clippers roof and trunk lid survived. At this time, Packard's president, George Christopher, insisted upon concentrating on sales of the company's lower-priced cars, while longtime competitor Cadillac focused its attention on the upper end of the market. The 22nd and 23rd series, from mid-1949, cars wore the upside-down bathtub styling that was briefly in vogue in the late 1940s. Unfortunately for Packard, Nash, Lincoln Mercury, and Hudson, the four manufacturers who embraced this type of styling, General Motors introduced designs that were lower slung, more tightly drawn and less bulbous at around the same time. GM's designs caught the buying public's fancy, while the bathtubs quickly fell from favor. Following a round of bitter corporate infighting in 1949, Packard management finally decided to phase out the bathtubs and create the all-new 24th series for 1951. The new, high pockets, design, so-called because of its high belt line, was much more modern. However, Packard continued to push hard into the lower end of the mid-priced field with its new, 200, and, 250, models. While the 250 hardtop and convertible, which would soon be named Mayfair, were an attempt to market upscale coupes which were slightly less bulky than the high-line sedans, and were decorated with chrome side scallops reminiscent of the top shelf 400, the 200 was a full-range, middle-priced line continuing to compete with Oldsmobile, DeSoto, Mercury, the Junior Hudsons, and others. James J. Nance became the company's president in 1952, and he immediately set to work on divorcing the lower-priced cars from the higher-end Packards. To this end, he decreed that the 200 and 200 Deluxe would be consolidated into a new line of clippers for 1953. Nance originally had hoped to introduce the new Clipper as a standalone mark, targeting the mid-range price field which he felt was dragging the Packard image down. When word was leaked to the Packard dealer network that they would be losing their best-selling Packard model to Clipper, they balked. As an appeasement, Nance rolled the Clipper out as a Packard and worked to transition the cars toward their own make. Thus, the Packard Clipper name was reintroduced and applied to the company's entry-level models, previously known as the Packard 200, beginning in 1953. Clippers were available in special and deluxe trim models, as two- and four-door sedans. A 1953 Clipper went from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 17.6 seconds in a popular mechanics test. The turning circle was 41 feet. For 1954, the Clipper by Packard, was given its own unique rear fender trim and taillights to further differentiate it from traditional Packards. 
The cars were also available with a distinctive two-tone paint pattern. For 1955, Packard became a mark in the newly formed Studebaker Packard Corporation. The 1955 Clipper Custom offered torsion bar suspension something not offered on other models, which only offered coil and leaf spring suspension. It also had a power steering option and an all-new Packard built V8 displacing 320 cubic inches, and was increased to 352 cubic inches in 1956. Drivers enjoyed the comfortable ride but complained of door rattles and poor workmanship. Length was 215 inches long. The Packard Clipper Constellation was a two-door hardtop automobile produced by the Studebaker Packard Corporation for the 1955 and 1956 model years. The 1955 model was a Packard product and sold as part of the Packard Clipper line. For 1956, Clipper split from Packard, becoming its own make. A total of 8,039 Clipper Deluxe, 14,995 Super and 15,380 Custom were built during model year 1955. Packard's president James Nance believed that as a Packard line, the Clipper models were diluting Packard's standing as a luxury automobile mark. There were also concerns that the Clipper was cannibalizing the sales of other models in the lineup. However, this had more to do with the ill-planned market differentiation strategy and less with the car itself. Despite being marketed to a lower income bracket consumer, the 1956 Packard and Clipper are essentially the same cars. The only real difference lay in the length, with Packard featuring a slightly longer wheelbase, however, company pushed ahead with making Clipper a separate nameplate. For the 1956 model year, the status of being a standalone make was emphasized by creating a separate Packard Clipper division within Studebaker Packard. Clipper's logo was a ship's wheel. The automaker required Packard franchise dealers to also execute a separate Clipper dealer sales agreement in order to sell the line. Studebaker agencies in areas not covered by separate Packard dealers were allowed to sign Clipper franchise agreements, and could also take on the regular Packard line as well. Subject to factory approval, Clippers began receiving unique trim and rear quarter panels in 1954, and when Packard introduced its redesigned model in 1955, the Clipper retained its older rear sheet metal while receiving two tone combinations that were unique to its models. For 1956, the Clipper received new rear sheet metal and tail light treatments. Clipper marketed two hardtop coupes, the Panama in the supermodel line and Constellation in the custom range. Both were carryover model names from the 1955 model year. Around mid-1955, dealers began complaining that consumers were lukewarm to the cars because they were true Packards and demanded that the Packard name appear somewhere on the cars. Nance refused at first feeling that placing the Packard name on the cars would undo his plan to save the Packard name for luxury automobiles. However, when dealers began defecting to Mercury franchises, Nance gave in, fearful that the shrinking number of dealers would harm the company more than just the Packard mark. A small, Packard, script emblem began to be placed on the decklids of newly built Clippers. In a complete reversal of Nance's strategy, the emblems were also made available for placement on already built cars that were languishing on dealers' lots. By the summer of 1956, Studebaker Packard was in financial trouble. The Packards and Clippers were not selling at anywhere near a profitable level, and the company's creditors refused to advance any further money to the company for new tooling that would have allowed Nance to finally realize his ultimate goal of sharing body components among the company's three lines of cars. In late July, the last Packards and Clippers rolled out of the Connor Avenue factory. Following the closure of Packard's Detroit, Michigan factory in 1956, the Clipper mark was discontinued, although the Clipper name was applied to 1957 Packards built at Studebaker's South Bend, Indiana factory. Following the closure of the Detroit, Michigan Packard plant, Studebaker Packard entered into a management contract with the Curtis Wright Company. Under CW's president, Roy T. Hurley, SP's new president Harold Churchill approved the production of a new Packard, to be built in Studebaker's South Bend, Indiana plant. The new Packards, originally to continue the Packard executive nameplate, were to share the Studebaker President four-door sedan body and new four-door station wagon body as well. The total tooling cost of the new Packard was estimated at $1 million. At some point, however, the executive name was dropped, as all of the Packards produced for 1957 carried the Packard Clipper name. Body styles were limited to a four-door, town sedan, and the, country sedan, station wagon. In order to keep the tooling cost as low as possible, trim components from the 1956 Clippers were used. 
This was done to make the 1957 model differ in appearance from the President. Outside, this included a narrower Packard-style front bumper and 1956 clipper tail lamps and chromed wheel covers. Other differences include thinned rear fenders and differing rear wheel panel treatments, as well as a wide chrome strip across the length of the car, extending across the tailgate on station wagons. Inside, the car's dashboards were fitted with the same basic instrument cluster as used in the previous two years, while trim levels were generally higher than for Studebakers. Sales of the new clippers were not great. Historians differ as to why, although the car's obvious Studebaker origins, which led the new clippers to be derisively nicknamed Packard Bakers, by many people, certainly did not help. Only about 4,800 were sold for the year, of which 869 were station wagons. The only engine option was the supercharged 289 cubic inches, 4,740 cubic centimeters, Studebaker V8. For 1958, the clipper name was discontinued, and the few Packard automobiles that were produced, four-door sedans, station wagons, and two-door hardtop coupes, were simply known by their mark name. The only exception to this was the Packard Hawk, which was based on the Studebaker Golden Hawk.